people think in some ways that journalism is falling apart. It's dying, or you know, is journalism going to survive? Uh, I was at a conference with some of you on Friday in New Haven, and that was sort of, is journalism, how to, how to save journalism. Well, that, as I see it, is not exactly what's happening. Um, journalism is not dying by any means. What's happening in, and I'm sure I'm going to miss some things in my description, is first of all, one part of our media universe is becoming far more robust than it's ever been. The discussion part of the media, the part in which people get to interact and comment on the news. Um, things are great and they're better than they've ever been. Um, but the reporting part of the media, where people go out with shoe leather and gather new information, is shrinking. And there are some uh, extraordinary experiments and new innovations in that, but I would say by any measures that we can come up with, the aggregate number of people who are out there uh, finding stuff out is smaller. The, 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 the new things that are, are growing up, which are so terrific, do not compensate for even the cutbacks in the, uh, that we can count in, in pretty traditional uh, news operations. Um, and certain kinds of shoe leather reporting in certain kinds of places are shrinking even more. Um, another thing that, I would, that we all know is that the technology has shifted power from the journalist as a lecturer to the consumer to be their own editor. If I were to interpret your hand raising, it's not that we're all becoming our own journalists, but we are becoming our own editors. We are creating our own diet of media every day. Uh, we are in charge of what we're uh, consuming. And I think that we are hunter-gatherers. We are proactive. When we go online, the posture, the interface that we have with media is drastically different. We're no longer having a relationship with one outlet and saying, what is it? What is the LA Times giving me today? We're looking for answers to our questions. We're Googling in our search or we're looking for things. Uh, the traffic data that I've seen suggests that people go in, get a story, go out, even if they go to a particular news organization. They're looking for a story, they're there briefly, look at two or three things, and then they go. Uh, and they may do that many times through the course of the day, which is another dramatic change that Merrill Brown first sort of clued me into more than 10 years ago, which is that news gathering is not something that, uh, news uh, consumption is not something that happens uh, at the beginning, at, brec at the breakfast table, or around dinner time. It's a serial activity that, uh, that uh, occurs now constantly throughout the day. There are particular moments of spike activity. Uh, but that means that sort of when you become interested in something, you go out and you find the answer to it. Um, the potential exists for a drastically better journalism than we've ever been able to produce before. I have a slide, but I'm not doing slides today, in which I say if you were to produce a, a piece of content uh, uh, in print, there are basically six elements that you could bring to it. Uh, your main narrative, a headline, uh, a photo, a graphic, um, a, a sidebar if you wanted to have a second piece, although that, there's limited room for that. And if you wanted to get real fancy, you might have a pull quote, you know, one of those enlarged quotes that is like a teaser to tell people what's in the story. Six elements. You might be able to gin up a couple more if you, if, to think about it. Um, online, and my list keeps growing, there are 53 elements that you could bring uh, to the coverage of, of an event. Uh, and the skill of a journalist is no longer simply knowing how to edit good narratives. It's knowing which of those 53 or 50 eight or 67 uh, tools to apply to that particular story. It's as if we've gone from building houses with a hammer and, and a saw uh, to having the whole uh, inventory of the Home Depot at our disposal, uh, and you have to know which tool fits the task. So what is the problem? Well, one big problem is the unbundling of news. The great dirty little secret of what we've done all these years is that we were able to force feed people uh, news that they might not know that they were interested in or they weren't interested in and we were able to monetize the coverage of that news with other things. 
we were able to pay for covering the city council with classified advertising and the bridge column and uh, the comics. And that has broken apart. As the consumer becomes a hunter-gatherer for the particular atomic unit of information that they're looking for, we can't, we're, it's no longer clear how we're gonna monetize the, the stories that are important but have small audiences because we no longer can, uh, in the same way, bundle all this stuff together and pay for the important things that don't have a huge audience with the things that we know have a big audience and actually may be pretty cheap. Um, so how do we monetize this civic news? That's a big part of the question. How do we, in, in, in other words, from a civic standpoint, uh, maintain a public square? Now, the fundamental problem, along with um, the unbundling that the technology has created, is um, that we don't know how uh, or if there is a revenue model online um, that is replicable and that can work in large metropolitan areas. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for this, and some of you know much more uh, about this uh, than I do. But one thing that I think is missed here is that it's a real open question about whether display advertising works online because of this shift of the way we interact with information. Search advertising is great because it's complementary to the activity that we're engaged in. We're hunting for things, we're looking for answers to our questions, and search advertising is, could be very helpful to that. But when you finally find the content, the display ad that pops up and crawls across the story is now an intrusion to, to that activity. You found the thing and now this thing shows up and it's annoying you. Um, and that's very different than the relationship you have with one news uh, organization that's giving you the news and here's, what the, here's what's coming from USA Today and I turn the page and oh, there's an ad for whatever. It's another piece of content that is coming from USA Today that's complementary to my sort of browsing what they're giving me. Uh, 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 so the, 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 the power shift with the consumer is what's making, I think, our relationship or the consumer's relationship with this advertising not work so well. And then, of course, you've got the technology. If this, if you go to Silicon Valley, they'll tell you this is the computer of the 21st century, not this big screen. Well, we were having trouble with display advertising on a desktop. So, if those are the basic problems, well, and one other thing, since the, the point of what I was supposed to say here is where are people getting information they need, that's the title of my talk, I'll, I'll spend a moment discussing that. <laughs> if you look at the traffic data, uh, and, and there are, again, people who know more about this than I do, I just uh, uh, pay money to, to the rating agencies and we puzzle through it. What you see is that at the moment, and this may change, but at the moment, old brands and old journalism are what have the greatest appeal on the web. Uh, in an analysis we did last year, if you looked at the 50 largest news sites, they grew by 27%. If you looked at the uh, uh, 700 biggest news sites, they grew by 7%. Now, what's in the, in the Biggest 50, all the old brands. In fact, last year, there was really only a couple of new media brands even in the top 50. Huffington Post was there. Drudge, if you want to call them a media brand, was there. But what you're talking about here is aggregators aggregating traditional media or the New York Times, the BBC. By the way, the BBC is huge in American traffic, huge. Um, uh, and so are some other more international-oriented English media. Um, there is even a theory, I don't know if I am fully uh, 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 persuaded by it, that the old media actually have a larger share, or the, or the large old media have a larger share of the audience online than they did in print. One statistic, it's about a year old now, that the top 10 newspapers had nine, represented 19% of newspaper circulation. Uh, they represent 29% of internet uh, newspaper uh, uh, traffic. Um, so, 
uh, the notion that people have said with the internet, oh, this is great. I can finally get away from these obnoxious media filter people with their values that they think are so important, but I knew were a delusion. That's not exactly what's happened, at least not yet. There is still value, in the, the, the market would suggest, in the values of verification, uh, of sorting through news. Um, uh, you know, I'll, many of us, I think, thought that Google News might be very quickly sort of the news site. It's not. It's not. It's, it's on the list, but it's, it's down there quite a ways. Uh, because actually having 2,000 versions of the same story at any given moment isn't as efficient a way of sorting out the news as having two or three that are more valuable. Um, so if, if, if there's value apparently in those old values, but there's unbundling, and there's no revenue model that looks replicable at a large scale to finance the news, um, where does that leave us? And I'll take just a few more minutes, uh, and then I, I think we wanted to have some Q&A, but I'll take a few more minutes to throw out some ideas about how we might think about uh, the future. One of them is uh, that technology, every technology has certain inherent biases in it. Television is a more naturally emotional medium than print. Uh, and it, on, it would seem at first glance that the internet and, and digital technology would offer the potential for everything, infinite depth, uh, tremendous interactivity, you could do anything. The tool is limitless. But at least at the moment, the data that we've looked at would suggest that the bias that is coming out from the way that people interact with the technology is towards speed, is toward immediacy, is towards quick gathering information, quickly people moving in and out. Um, and I would submit that the best journalism is produced by people who are conscious of and resist the limits of the bias of the technology they work in. The best TV work is not the stuff that indulges in the cheap emotionalism that TV can offer, but uses the emotionalism, but also pushes against it to do work that is more serious, more abstract. So one of the tasks that we have in, our, in, this, in this century is, are we going to be captives of this tendency towards people for immediacy and that's all? Or will we figure out ways to resist that so that we can employ the depth that the, that the technology also offers? And that's a human issue, a values issue, not just a, uh, you know, it's how we use the metrics and, and, uh, and how we react to them. Another idea that I would throw out is that Part of our problem, at least so far, is in defining what we mean by a news organization. To, 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 most, to, to, to a large extent, news organizations define themselves by what they produce, what they do. Um, you know, newspapers print uh, stories on paper and sell advertising. Radio uh, produces stories and puts them out on the air, and some of them sell advertising, not so many anymore. Um, uh, television puts uh, stories out on newscasts. And I would submit that that's part of our problem, that navigating the future of news means that we need to understand the function that a news organization plays in its community and figure out how can new ways to perform that fundamental function. And in that, we may find new businesses and new forms of monetization. What does that mean? Sounds good, kind of abstract. What does that mean? Well, here's my first crude attempt, or my, my crude attempt at the moment at trying to define what the function of a news organization is in a community. I think, and I have a better versions of it somewhere in my briefcase, I think that news organizations accumulate knowledge about how a community works and disseminate it. But for the most part, we have done that in extraordinary limited ways. That much of the knowledge that actually flows into newsrooms is sitting in Rolodexes and reporters' heads. It's on the floor. Uh, people weren't too conscious of it. We put out, I don't know what, it, maybe 
10% of the knowledge that we is in the newsroom is pushed out into, into the uh, products that we produce. Um, so there's a lot there in this knowledge that we uh, can make businesses out of if we can figure out how do people use this knowledge? What value does it have to them? And what are new ways that we could, uh, what are the knowledge that we have? What are some knowledges we could acquire that we don't have? And what are new ways that people would want to interact with it? And new markets that exist there. It could be that there are specialized markets that can subsidize that civic news. It could be that there is all kinds of services in that knowledge that we've got that we could imagine. If you were inventing this business, you'd think about it this way. If you're trying to save an old business, you might not think about it this way. I would submit that that's why old newsrooms thought, well, aggregation's not journalism. That's, that's some kind of technology thing. Um, or why eBay wasn't journalism. My old company was offered the chance to buy eBay. I think they might have been offered the chance to buy Google. I'm not sure of that. But uh, I think in either case, it's not clear that eBay or Google would have become what they have become had they been bought by a news company. And, I'll, and I want to throw out two more ideas before I stop. One, do we care whether the old institutions survive? Personally, I, I think the, it, no, I don't. But there are values and skills in those old institutions that I think, as a citizen, I feel we do have a vested interest in. And some of those are the values of an independent press, the skills of verification, the idea that the purpose of journalism is to inspire discussion, not a particular political outcome. That's a fundamental difference between a political activist and a journalist. We want people to think about these things, but we're not rooting for one side or one outcome. And it changes everything about the way we interact with the information. And it's not, so what is the best way to have those values survive? It's not necessarily so that if old journalists go to new media, that old values survive in new media. Uh, it didn't happen in local TV, which started out as essentially radio with many of the values of, uh, of NBC and, and CBS News, but that gradually shifted. And local TV has a really a, a quite different set of values uh, eventually. Uh, even network TV in some ways you know, evolved out of its radio origins. Um, so things happen over time. And the last thing I, I, I want to leave you with is, OK, the journalism needs to change. And the dominant metaphor that we used in the 20th century for journalism was that the journalist was a gatekeeper. And what that idea meant was that Merrill's the newsmaker. Finally get to live out your fantasy. Susan is, uh, and, and Michael is the public. Well, Merrill has to go through Susan to get to Michael. And Susan was the press. She was the gatekeeper. And she decided what of what Merrill said was gossip and rumor and innuendo and what was fact, and she decided she, which facts of Merrill's she would let Michael know about. And that was the notion of what the gatekeeper did. There are famous quotes from people about it, which I could uh, uh, incorrectly remember and give to you. But clearly, that metaphor doesn't work anymore, because there are multiple ways that Merrill could get his message to Michael. So, what are the functions or the roles that journalists played or that we need journalism to play or that we need in civic society uh, about our information? I'm going to throw out eight of them uh, that I think were embodied in the gatekeeper uh, uh, metaphor that we want to have survive or that we want the press to play. And I want to enumerate them because I think we'll create a better journalism if we, if we become more conscious of what these things are. One is we need the press or someone to authenticate the news. We hear so many things from so many different sources. There's a yearning to know what here can I believe? Which facts are right and which facts have been shaded in such a way that they're misleading? Are, what does the public option mean? Are there death panels? Are illegal immigrants going to get this health care? Um, 
Does Merrill Brown have the answer to the future? I need somebody to authenticate these things for me. We also want the press to be a sense maker. It's no longer enough for the press to simply say, the mayor said this at the garden party yesterday. We need to know, was he lying? Why did he say this? Why did he say that and not something else? Uh, the best journalism we have often is the, is the stories that make the tumblers click. We need the press to be a watchdog, as it's always been. We also need the press to bear witness. That more, more mundane task of showing up or having someone show up at the city council meeting, at the zoning commission meeting, so that they know that someone's watching. It's important. There's a prophylactic effect of the press simply just showing up where no one else is. We need the press to be a forum leader, and that means obviously a lot more now than uh, letters to the editor. That function of the press can be so much more robust than it's ever been. We need the press to be a smart aggregator, not just tell me your stories, but tell me what other stories are out there that you think I should also read. We need the press to empower its audience, to give them tools, ways to participate. And whether we like it or not, the press is also now a role model. Since people are engaging in journalism themselves, if not the most people, at least some. And if anyone might be a journalist at the moment that they see the tsunami and they pull out their cell phone and take pictures, they're inevitably going to look to us for how do you do this. So we are, our public conduct in some ways is more important than it's ever been because people are emulating us and not just judging us. And all that means in the end that journalism has shifted from being a product, our stories, our stuff, to being a service. The journalist of the 20th century is, gonna, is the one who can say, how can I answer your questions? How can I help you get the answers? And that role, that new role, means that the public has to respect us and also we have to respect their ability to do this. And that in itself may be a big shift for us. That's it. Thank you.